Good morning and welcome to worship at Wild Rose United Church and this beloved community who seek to embody the welcome of Jesus. No matter who you are, where you have been, or who you love, there is a place here for you. My name is Murray Spear. My personal pronouns are he and him, and I'm privileged to be the minister at Wild Rose United Church. With me in the sanctuary this morning providing the service are Dan Somerville and Diane McKenzie, uh, Bill Boyle and Deb Boyle, Corinne Salajano, Bill Aitken, and Don McIntosh, and Linda Ellis. And Alison Bobnick will be uh, providing a portion of the service uh, by recording. As we gather, we acknowledge wherever we stand, uh, that we stand on the traditional territories of the indigenous peoples of Canada. And we acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the First Peoples, particularly in our case, the Peoples of Treaty 7, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Kainai, Siksika, and Pikani First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation, and the three nations of the Stony Nakoda, Wesley, Bearspaw, and Chiniki. Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Zone 3. We are all treaty people, and we all have work to do in reconciling and healing the broken relationships of centuries. Following uh, the service this morning, starting at 11.30, is our annual congregational meeting, as well as the annual meeting of the Wild Rose Foundation. Uh, and so I hope that uh, anyone who considers yourself uh, a part of this community of faith has uh, put that into your schedule. If you are watching uh, live this morning and consider yourself part of this community of faith and do not have access to that meeting yet, and want to attend. Please uh, let me know, probably through Facebook or email if you have it, um, and uh, we'll get you set up. And now I will invite uh, Deb Boyle and Bill Boyle to light our candle and share our call to worship. Dear God, we light this candle as a reminder that Christ was sent as a light to our as a light to our path, that we might shine as a light to the world. Amen. Call to worship this morning, based on Psalm 22, verses 23 to 31. The uh, response is in the uh, darker bold. When I cried for help, God heard my suffering. Therefore, I will praise you in the assembly of O God. Let those who suffer taste God's goodness and worship. Let all the powerful taste God's goodness and worship. Future generations will hear about the Holy One, and people yet to be born will hear about God's saving acts. Amen. As we gather for worship, we come with burdens of fear, guilt, grief, or anger, let us lay our burdens down at the feet of the one who is always ready to listen in a time of unburdening. Let us pray. God of refreshing and sustaining love, we are thirsty for your presence. We return here week by week because we yearn for the cool water of your word in our lives. 
in this season of Lent, which we set aside to pay attention to both need and blessing, and to focus our hearts on you. Open our eyes to your gifts all around us. Open our ears to your gentle calling. Open our lives to the truth of your grace. Help us to worship you and to follow Jesus and to be the body of Christ in the world. Amen. And now Dan and Linda will lead us in our hymn. I thought today we could talk a little bit about symbols. A symbol is something simple that conveys something complicated, at least something more complicated than itself. So here's an example of a simple symbol. It's just an octagon in the color red. It's a geometric symbol that anyone can draw, anyone who has a, uh, a ruler and a, and a compass can draw this, but it has meaning, doesn't it? In our culture it has meaning. Someone from a very, very different culture or uh, uh, someone who 
has never seen this before, won't know what it means. But we know what it means, right? Here's another one that's a little less simple. You folks in the sanctuary, what do you think this one means? Linda says it makes her hungry. Anyone else? Well, it means, it means food or a restaurant, doesn't it? But again, someone from a very different culture or who had never seen this before, they wouldn't necessarily know that a circle means a food plate. They wouldn't necessarily know that this fork shape is for eating. Here's one that, that anyone on earth should be able to figure out if they can think about it hard enough. Folks in the sanctuary, do you got this one? Rain. And we use this, we use this in our weather forecasts, don't we? When uh, on the TV or on the internet or on our phones, we look for what, uh, what the weather is going to be like uh, later today or in the next days of the week. This tells us that there, there might be rain coming. They're starting to get a bit more complex. Here's one that might be a little bit less uh, well-known. Do you see this one? Folks in the sanctuary, do you know what this one is? power button, yeah, it's, it's actually on and off. It's an on and off button. And it's a combination of uh, a one and a zero. Meaning there, there are two, uh, two settings, on and off, one and zero. Here's a symbol we mostly see at church but also in graveyards, and also sometimes uh, at the side of the road where someone has died, someone who is a Christian, and maybe other places. Maybe you know someone who, uh, who wears this symbol visibly, even when they aren't at church. I wear mine when I'm at church most of the time, when I can find it. Sometimes it's hiding under other things, and I can't find it in time to put it on. But this is another symbol. Something simple, a simple design that anyone can draw that holds deeper meaning. And we've used this in lots of different ways. People have used this symbol in lots of different ways. Even Christians have used it in lots of different ways. But I want to tell you about how I use it. I want to tell you about what the deeper meaning for me is of this because it connects to what we're going to hear from the Bible in just a minute. In just a minute, in our Bible reading, Jesus is going to say that his followers are supposed to take up a cross and follow him. That's what this shape is called. It's called a cross. The cross was a symbol of violence and torture. It was a symbol of a mighty empire who used it to uh, frighten and control people. And sometimes it's used in such a not very different way than that, even now. But when Jesus tells his followers to take it up, we have to wonder, what does he mean? Here's what I think he means. I think he means that when you love the world as much as he does, it's not always going to be easy. When you love the world as much as he does, sometimes it might mean getting hurt. When you love the world as much as he does, sometimes it means people will try to frighten and control you. 
So when I wear that symbol, it's to remind me of two things. It's to remind me of how much Jesus and God love the world. And it's to remind me of how hard it can sometimes be to love the world as much as they do. Thank you so much for talking about symbols with me today. We're now going to have a recording of uh, Allison reading scripture for us. Reading from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 to 38, the Common English Bible. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples. The human one must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the legal experts, and be killed. And then, after three days, rise from the dead. He said this plainly, but Peter took hold of Jesus and, scolding him, began to correct him. Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, then sternly corrected Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. After calling the crowd together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves. Take up their crosses and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them. But all who lose their lives because of me and because of the good news will save them. Why would people gain the world but lose their lives? What will people give in exchange for their lives? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this unfaithful and sinful generation, the human one will be ashamed of that person when he comes in the Father's glory with the holy angels. Oh. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God for the word. It might surprise you to hear that I think in the second part of today's reading that Jesus is teaching his disciples about evolution. Evolution, the, the word, the concept, excuse me, I'm just going to turn this up a little bit. The word, the concept, is about the way that all growth and change happens in the universe. On every level, on every scale, from the scale of galaxies to the scale of quarks and amino acids, solar systems and planets, populations and individuals. And within this range are not only physical and biological evolution, but cultural and social and individual growth and change. The same principles apply to all processes, whether they are organic or physical, including congregations. So, there are a few principles to talk about if the same principles apply. Whether you're talking about genes or cells or individuals or populations or species or congregations. The first is that when a system is threatened, 
whether that system is, is uh, an individual or a, a community. It has the ability to reorganize itself on a deeper level. with a deeper understanding and complexity. Now, when we think of evolution as taking place uh, on this scale of a species, that reorganization at a deeper level of complexity might take place over the course of several generations. But in the case of a human individual, that deeper understanding and complexity can take place over the course of a single lifetime. This week was the 29th anniversary of the death of my mother. My father was widowed uh, at a young age. He was widowed at 45 with uh, three children under the age of 20. And by this experience, his existence was threatened. I remember I traveled with him uh, to, uh, to Europe in uh, around 2003. We went to Spain and we went to Gibraltar. And uh, on the rock of Gibraltar, which was once a military installation and still has some... Uh, broadcasting and, and radar facilities or whatnot, but no longer has a, a military base on the top of the rock, uh, now has a wildlife refuge on the top. And it is a refuge for a colony of Barbary macaques, uh, which are monkeys, tailless old world monkeys. So they're sometimes called Barbary apes because they're tailless, but they aren't apes, they're monkeys. And we were up there, we went up to the top, we were tr walking around in this uh, protected wildlife area. And uh, I remember this so clearly because my father said, it's amazing how you can look at a colony of monkeys and see so much familiarity in terms of behaviors and expressions and, and so on. And he said, but I'm not sure I understand how evolution works. And so this was my opportunity to point out to him how he had evolved. When he was facing a threat or a challenge due to changes in his environment, he incorporated new traits into himself. He learned how to do things he didn't know how to do before. He learned how to communicate with his children in a way that he hadn't had to do before because he'd had a partner to facilitate that communication. He learned how to manage uh, the family farm on his own because he had had a partner to do that with. He learned how to survive. And he survived not through the application of brute force or through the application of um, um, any other kind of power, but he survived through evolution by incorporating new traits in response to changes in his surroundings. When we become different than we were, we are not other than we were. He is not having evolved. He is not a different or other person than he was. He is different. He has changed, but he is not another person. He has incorporated a deeper understanding and a deeper level of complexity so that what he was continues, is included, but is also transcended.
Another principle. When a form of life goes extinct by means other than overhunting, when the unique species of the Amazon rainforest are disappearing by the hundreds, not by overhunting, but by destruction of habitat and changes to their surroundings. By definition, the disappearance of the last individual of that species has zero impact on its surroundings. Because by the time the last individual of a species ceases to exist, that species by definition has become obsolete. The surroundings have changed to such a degree that they no longer support the existence of that variety or species. And they no longer rely on that variety or species. I skipped over some things. I'm sorry. I skipped over Jesus, which you should never do as a preacher. In the first portion, this understanding that evolution means incorporating a deeper understanding or deeper complexity is what Jesus means, I'm convinced, when he says that it is necessary for the chosen one to suffer, which is completely different from any understanding of his time. For the understandings of his time, the chosen one is above suffering. The chosen one is beyond suffering. The chosen one may choose to inflict suffering, but for, for it to be necessary for the chosen one to suffer is an understanding of such depth and complexity that uh, it's frankly shocking. But Jesus perceived, or uh, in our Gospels, as they are written, Jesus perceives that it is necessary for that deeper understanding to be incorporated. Jesus is also, in our passage, describing the second principle, that when a, when a form of life goes extinct, by definition, that extinction has no impact on its surroundings. When Jesus says that people are thinking human thoughts rather than God's thoughts. And when people says, or pardon me, when, sorry. Folks, I'm going to explain what's going on. I'm using notes that I wrote several years ago. <laughs> and I read them earlier this week. I really did. And then I had more thoughts. <laughs> and now I'm having trouble following the notes. Here's what I'm getting at. Jesus says, those who love their lives will lose them. And those who are willing to lose their lives for the gospel may gain them. We gain life by making meaningful contrib contributions to our surroundings. By giving away life to our surroundings we receive it back. But if we cling tightly to our old form, if we refuse to change and grow, if we refuse to let go of what came before and allow it to be transcended and included, then we will lose the life that is being offered to us. It has to be a giving and a receiving. It cannot be a clinging to what has been. When Jesus says that his disciples are thinking human thoughts and not God's thoughts, he means, quite frankly, 
that God is here waiting to give us life. And our decision is whether we open ourselves to that flow, allowing ourselves to be transformed, or whether we cling to some less complicated form of ourselves. The third principle. third principle is one of the most difficult because we think in terms of our own individual life, our own individual loss, our own individual threats. We are not good at thinking on scales other than the scale of one human life. The third principle is that death serves life by moving us onward in a sequence of transformations. Solar systems are born because a previous generation of star has exploded. That star dies, but the matter that made it up re, uh, recoalesces and gives rise to new forms. A community or social organization may cease to exist, but the Things that made it up, whether they are ideas or people, carry on and form the nurturing matrix for what grows next. Leaves and trees and boughs fall to the floor of a forest and allow greater complexity in that uh, system to grow from their remains. What is necessary to remember is that what comes before is never abandoned or forgotten, but is included and transcended. There are forms of pine tree whose seeds cannot spread unless their uh, cones explode in the heat of a fire. So that even when all is burnt, those seeds are open in a way that they were not before. We have to be prepared for some change to feel like death and loss. I read a very provocative article a number of years ago about church life that said a growing church is a dying church. Because if you wish to grow as a church, you must take the people who come through your door as they are. The people who come through the door of a growing church will, of course, obviously, not be the same as the people who are already there. Not only because every person is unique, but because a person who comes to a church is bringing with them some form of pain or brokenness or struggle or fear. 
and that changes us. As the composition of our communities changes, as we become more intercultural, as populations who were tiny in our greater society become larger, as younger generations learn more about how to express their, uh, their identity, the people who walk into the doors of the church, every single one of them will represent change and change is loss. So we must, must be prepared to lose what we have been in order to save what we can. As congregations, we are facing changes in our surroundings that seem unprecedented. Some uh, researchers suggest that we are seeing change on a 500-year um, scope. Changes similar to those experienced, in other words, during the Reformation in Europe. during the Great Schism between the Roman Church and the Byzantine Church, which are now called Catholic and uh, um, Orthodox. Changes on the scope of the raising of, Christian, of Christianity to imperial status. Events that happened 500, 1,000, and 1,500 years ago. Other researchers are suggesting that the changes we are experiencing may be on a 2,000-year scope. On the scale of the intersection between Judaism and Greek philosophy and Roman power that gave rise to Christianity in the first place. Our challenge is not to control or to understand these changes. Our challenge is not to wait until we understand what is happening before we act, which is always my challenge. Our challenge is to hear the voice of Jesus ringing clearly. If we focus on scrambling to save what we have had, clinging tightly to what we have been, then we will surely lose all of what makes us alive. If we focus on what our surroundings can do for us instead of what we can do for our surroundings, then we will become obsolete. God is among us neither to control nor to simply reassure with good feelings, but to draw us deeper into more complex understandings of ourselves and of the world and of our task.
the only way to survive change on this scale is to make positive contributions to our surroundings and not in the way that we are used to but in the way that God is calling us to. So let us not be afraid. Let us not be afraid of what we might lose. Let us not be afraid that we might step too far. Let us not be afraid of what might be on the other side of death. Whatever form of death we're talking about. Because no matter what form we take, whether we are in these grand buildings, whether we are displaying the cross, whether we are reading the scriptures, all of which I hope we will continue to do and I see no reason that we won't, but whatever shape, the future takes. It is God calling us to make meaningful contributions, to care for those most in need of care, to speak the truth of justice to those in power. and to organize ourselves in ways that promote life and peace and hope, who will provide the liveliness that will carry us forward. May it always be so. Amen. Dan and Linda will lead us in another hymn.
Jesus Christ is dancing, dancing in the streets, where each sign of hatred he with love defeats. Listen, Lord Jesus, I should triumph too. On suspicion's graveyard, let me dance with you. Jesus Christ is calling, calling in the street. Who will join my journey? I will guide their feet. Listen, Lord Jesus, let my prayers of the people this morning are based on Psalm 23, uh, there will be a time of silence during the prayer, during which we can each offer up our own concerns and petitions. And when we pray together in community, the concerns of each of us are shared by all of us. Let us pray. Loving God, you are our shepherd, and today we bring our prayers before you. Our lives have seen so many valleys of deep darkness. We pray especially today for those whose lives have been touched by sorrow through accident and act of nature, through the violence of others, and through the inevitability of illness and frailty. We pray also for those who commit acts of violence and terror, both large and small, that their hearts may be warmed by your gentle presence and their grief, fear, and anger dispelled. We pray for your church and all the faithful in the world as they strive to listen for your call and to follow your path. Lead us to grassy meadows, we pray. Guide us to waters of peace. We look forward to a time when none will be in need, when those who have much will not have too much, and those who have little will not have too little. Until that time, be with the peoples and leaders of all nations that they will know your spirit of reconciliation and justice. We look forward to a time when none will be oppressed, when prejudice, discrimination, dehumanization, and hatred will come to an end. Until that time, be with humankind and help us to feel your tenderness and grace. We look forward to a time when all will live with respect in creation, offering dignity to your entire created order and using the gifts of the land, sea, and sky with reverence and humble care. Until that time, be with all the places in the world that are crying out due to pollution, over-industrialization, or loss of habitat. In all these things, we will fear no evil, for you are with us. We pray for all those among us and close by us who are suffering the pain of sickness, loneliness, fear, or loss. We pray that all those who are in our hearts and minds today and who are known to you alone will receive strength and courage and be comforted by your supportive rod and staff, your soothing oil, and your overflowing cup. At this time, we remember before you in a time of silence all those people and places whose trials and celebrations are burdening and encouraging us today. We pray in silence. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. We gather these and all our prayers, thankful that we may turn to you as to a grandmother who watches over us and pray together as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. On the screen and also available on the website are all of the different ways that uh, we can express our uh, financial support for the ongoing ministries of Wild Rose United Church. Thank you on behalf of the congregation and the board for all of the gifts uh, and contributions you have made and have continued to make. Uh, thank you to everyone who has pledged for 2021 and everyone who has registered for PAR. Whatever gifts we are able to offer, all of our gifts further the renewing and reconciling work of God and the church. And while we contemplate our offering, uh, Dan will share some music. Encouragement. Life is ours both to receive. Should I start over the prayer? Would that, Corinne? No. Life is ours both to receive from you and to give to others. We dedicate our lives to your good ends. Amen. Now I invite you to join me in the words of the sending forth in the portions printed in yellow. Jesus taught his followers to set their own needs aside. Let us set our minds on the thoughts of God. Jesus taught his followers to risk their lives for the gospel. Let us open ourselves to the movement of the Spirit. Jesus taught his followers to live their faith boldly. Let us listen to Christ's call in our lives. Amen. Now may the blessing of God give us strength for our journey. May the spirit of wisdom give us vision on the way. May the love of Christ make us caring companions as together we go forth. Amen.